recording all right welcome everyone back to a, another episode of serious angler podcast uh with us tonight we have benjamin nowak uh michigan hammer uh, <laughs> from uh social media and youtube how are we doing tonight man good man good. i don't i don't know about michigan hammer but i like to catch fish so <laughs> well, i mean all, all the pictures <laughs> see if you sharing are pretty dang big so uh, you, I, man. I say hammer is a good category thank you but, yeah, I mean, to start things off, the way we always start these episodes off is uh, we just want to hear a little bit of background about you and you know how you got into fishing and what kind of started that all. Uh, so I've been fishing my entire life. Like I grew up fishing. My parents and grandparents got me into the sport, right? So they started me young and I would just fish for anything. So bluegill, panfish, bass, catfish, it, like it didn't matter. Um, for those of you guys that don't know me, I'm from Michigan. So I'm from up north. Um, and so like, you just kind of have all these different species of fish that you can fish for. And then I basically got into bass fishing at 17 and kind of got eaten up by that. And I've been doing that for the past 10 years. So <laughs> kind of like for a lot of people that are like been in bass fishing for a while, 17 is kind of like, I want to say late, but it's like you hear of like all these stories, guys like, yeah, I started when I was four or five. My grandpa got me into it. It's, like, it's see, funny that's kind of- because like, I know you're from up North too. And so like the big deal is, up here, there's not a bunch of people that bass fish, right? I mean, you have you have a select few, but most of the guys up here, like, walleye fish, or they fish for bluegill or panfish or pike or whatever. But, like, I didn't even know a tournament existed. I didn't even know, like, what a bass boat was. And yeah. this is no joke. The first exposure I ever had to a bass boat was uh, Mike Ike and these City Limits Fishing. And oh, okay. just kind of – and I'm 27, so I'm not that old, but – 10 years ago, like the sport of bass fishing was so much different than it is now. Like you didn't have social media, you didn't have all these college and high school fishing programs. So college fishing was just starting. Um, That's kind of how I actually got my foot in the door with like the whole fishing industry and fishing thing. And then, you know, city limits fishing came out. Yeah. Yeah, I remember remember waking up uh, as a kid on the weekends, my typical uh, peanut butter sandwich breakfast and go watch (laughs) it. Uh, Mike Ike Canelli on TV, yeah, uh, for those days. But yeah, but yeah, we we have so many like, especially us Northerners, we have like especially Northeast at least. We all have all those great lakes around us where there's guys going out for crappie and walleye and things. You're, you know, for me at least, I'm in a one track mind of it's only bass. Like if I my friends yeah. go for something else, I'm like you're crazy. Like bass are biting. Why would you not go for bass? Yes. And so I'm seeing all these guys that are like, oh, they're going out catching bass, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh no, they're going after crappie. They're going after pike. Like. It's it's crazy. You got a whole bunch of different stuff. Well, as a northern guy, like you can relate. There's just so many other species, right? Yeah. That bass are now like trash fish, or they're kind of like <laughs> second fiddle to walleye, or something that you can actually eat. Yeah. So, like, that's a big thing. Yeah, and then and it's like uh, I can't remember. I think it was Lake Fort, one of Lake Fork guys' episode. He was talking about how he's like, you know, in, in the north, it's so different because you can go and you can fish for a bunch of different stuff when. Down in Texas, it's either bass or crappie. You don't have much of anything else. Yeah. Unless, unless you're trying to go bow fish for something, but like that's exactly. that's all you know, can do. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, you started getting the bass fish around 17. When did that whole when did the YouTube thing kick off? When did you want to get into filming? So I've been like doing dabbling with like video and filming for a long time. So when I was 10 years old, there's a guy that owns a video production studio in in the city I'm from. Um, and he taught me how to edit. So I came up through high school learning how to edit. Well, it wasn't until college that I got into bass fishing. And then I kind of saw Brandon Polinux. Um, he had a video where he was on Okeechobee and he put the song Sail, the AWOL Nation behind it. And I was like, dude, that is so cool. <laughs> right? Like that's what I grew up doing with, with um, a lot of my video stuff. I was doing like lacrosse highlights or hockey highlights or, you know, this, that, or the other. But then I'm like, dude, you take hockey or you take, fishing and these highlight montages and you blend the two and that's really cool uh-huh. so my first videos were of that like one is counting stars um, by one republic one is like wake me up by a vg so i have like four or five different videos you can go way back on my channel you can find those but i got really started in 2014 or 2015 dang yeah wow so, See, your, your first couple of videos are pretty cool. Mine are grabbing a, a 
can of corn with a little ice <laughs> rod and going after a carp in a canal like that. But did, so here's a question. Did you start by like filming yourself with like a chess camera and be like, guys, we're going out and we're going to try and catch fish like carp with corn, like the vlog style stuff? Like, I didn't even start talking to the camera until I think it, yeah, it was this like May when I actually started talking to the camera because I had tried it. I, I, I tell you, I've probably been talking to the camera for almost two years. But I get home and I get I look at the footage, and I get so self conscious of myself. Where I'll be sitting there, I'm like, I don't like the sound of my voice. Delete, and I'm just put just yeah. catching. And then guys were like, like saying, like a bunch of my buddies of mine. Um, and shout out to my buddy John pa, John Petro down in Texas. He's like, dude, you just gotta talk to people. It's like, who cares? Like, just go for it. Like, you can. Have, it seems like you enjoy it. Just like, just post it. And yeah. I, the first time and like the views skyrocketed not i mean obviously not skyrocketed a very small channel but like compared to the other videos it was a big differential i'm like all right and that and i enjoy doing it it's kind of cool to like explain what you're doing and why you're doing it so I think, that's that's when i got into it, it was like i mean this past may so that's sweet dude. very recent yeah i think seeing like the progression of youtube is very interesting to me because like when i started it was only montage videos and like you had john b and you had flair and one rod and that was real i mean fluke and mikey yeah. and that was really it like that's all you had so no one was doing the vlog style no one was doing like i'm gonna put a camera on my chest and i'm gonna go and film myself fish it was all like we're gonna do these highlight montages we're gonna do like i think brendan's famous role of fishing was there too but you had a handful of channels yeah yeah you, you had a handful of channels and they were all just kind of you know fishing and just not really talking to the camera or doing like very basic tip videos. And then you had um, Lunkers TV, Rob Turkla. Yeah. I want to say kind of changed the whole situation of it all. And it's interesting to see that happen. But, you know, in 2013, 2014, or 2014, 2015, it all kind of shifted and changed, which is yeah. now where it is now. So, yeah. I think, I think he. Wasn't Rob one of the first guys on YouTube to get a actual like cameraman to follow him around? He might have been. I'm not entirely sure, but I know like he was the first guy to do like daily vlogs. Yeah. Like daily fishing vlogs. And yeah. then he started the Goodman Squad up and like he had very high quality audio and like really focused on all the stuff that everyone else was just kind of behind on. Yeah. So and it was cool waking up to videos every day of you know, him fishing and everything. And I still remember watching his videos back in the day when he was in the tournament fishing. Yeah. And it was just, all it was was a GoPro strapped to his boat, and that was it, just him fishing. Dude, I think it was the the BFLs, like the Opens. Yes. Just getting to those. And then now he's going on farm ponds, doing military Mondays and stuff. And Yeah. It's crazy to see growth. Like, I think that's one of the things I'm most addicted to is seeing growth, whether it's in, you know, school, sports, uh, and like media stuff, growth just like just fires me up. I don't know. I, I love I that. And like, I'll look at like my, like it sounds petty, but I'll look at my follower count and I'll look at it like somebody like obviously unfollow me. I'll see the number go down. And I know it's just like the weird spam accounts, but I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, wow, somebody unfollow me. And I think about what I'm <laughs> wrong. I'm like, oh, I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm 100% with you. Like, the thing that motivates me to, create more content or do more videos is when people either like really enjoy it or I start to see a lot of growth. Yeah. Right. Like those are the two main things. And it's sad to say, but like growth is a big part of that. Like oh, yeah. if I never grew another sub, I would feel really bad. And I'd be like, man, I'm not doing something right. Yep. I suck. Oh, for sure. So, yeah. If you make it like in your mind, you're thinking like, I'm not making enough exciting content to draw people in, like especially retaining, you know, yeah. those that you have. Because um, like you can have like the clicks, but if you don't have like the view at the time, then you're you don't really know like if you're actually putting out a good video or not. So yeah, I, exactly. And that's what's cool about YouTube is that you can look at the analytics of the side of it, or you can go into me like, okay, yeah, this video been, has been viewed, but how long has it been viewed for? Yeah, it's kind of cool. Is you know you. You spend more time looking at what part of the video did they watch, and then the one part that didn't, you take that into account. Like, is it worth even putting this in the video next time? Yeah, it's kind of cool when you dwell into the strategy side of it. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah, and like, 
One, one of your videos, actually, it was recent that I really, it was kind of like a video I've never even seen before. It was um, you and Rob Matsura when you guys oh. did the Great Lake Challenge. Yeah. That was awesome. I was like, who would even thought of that? Like, that was, that was, that was pretty cool. We had so much fun doing that, man. Like, Rob called me up, and we had known we were going to do it for a couple of weeks because I've known Rob for a lot of, little while now. But um, he called me up. He's like, dude, when I get up to St. Lawrence, we're going to do this Great Lakes Challenge. Like, I'm going to give you all my footage. And what's what people don't know about that is, like, dude, Rob is, like, a genius with the stuff he shoots. Uh-huh. And so I have, like, some of the craziest, like, Rob Master of B-roll that I don't know what to do with. I'm like, dude, I don't even know how to edit this stuff together. Because I have so much of his, like, his drone footage and his, like, uh, Sony B-roll footage and underwater. I mean, Rob is, like, a genius with, with all of that. Yeah, and he's... He acts like he doesn't know much about it because I like I, I commented on one of his things. I'm trying to remember what it was, but he was up near me. He was in Skinny Atlas, which is 45 minutes from my hometown. Yeah. And I had commented on one of the things like, "Oh, that's pretty sick. Like I know where you are. Like that's that's pretty cool that you guys are up there, you know, fishing." He's with Tyler's Tyler's real fishing. Yeah. He's with him, and he commented was like, "We were talking and chatting about New York and everything." And I was asking him about like his camera stuff. He goes, "Yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing. Just kind of point the camera." I'm like. Oh, that's a load of bull. You know what you're doing. I, I know, dude. Like, he came and stayed with me last year for, uh, I think he stayed here for, like, two days. But So we got to really dive into, like, how he films and, like, what he thinks when he's filming and, like, how he puts this stuff together. Because he doesn't write any of it down. It's not like he's like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, pan left and then I have to pan left into my next shot. Dude, Rob is just, like, a genius. <laughs> and he is so humble and acts like, oh yeah it just happened like i just happened to get the right shots i'm like no dude yeah he has one video if you guys haven't seen it he takes his drone and it was done on uh i think it was down on lake Tahoe in Kissimmee, florida this year on the flw tour he flies his drone up into the sky and to kind of stage the the video all these guys were fishing this big general area well he had, flies his drone way up in the sky and then he goes and does a single shot no cuts circles it around like eight people and then he like gets them in the way in line, and he gets audio and overlays it on that on that clip. Like I'll I'll uh, send you the clip on Instagram. But dude, it is the most impressive thing. Like to do perfect circles with the drone around people, and like have it all. I don't even know how he came up with the idea, but he's a genius, dude. That's why everybody appreciates his work in the business because you know. Yeah. You know what you're trusting in him. You're going to get out some good content. Yeah, he's a genius. He, he follows around Scott Martin a little bit too, doesn't he? Yeah. Because yep. he works with uh, Brandon a little bit. Yeah. He's another one that's pretty dang good with his stuff too. Brandon is also a genius. Yeah, Brandon's yeah. very good. It, it's, I think I always like uh, Scott Martin's videos in the, the mornings of tournaments and stuff when he goes to Lake <laughs> Club. I always find that really Especially when he yeah. tries to pick up Brandon, he just tells him to leave. That's yeah. Just, I just find that pretty comical. Yeah, Brandon's a good dude. You did um, where was it? The St. Lawrence River. You went up with a couple of guys to do photography for FLW. Uh, so I went to actually all the events this year. So I went you to went to, all, okay. I yeah, know. I went to Rayburn, Rayburn, Kissimmee, Seminole, Grand Lake, Cherokee, Champlain, Hamilton. I went. I went to all. It was awesome. It was think, a really. I think it was Champlain where I saw, or I, like I realized where it said like the camera thing with your name on it. I'm like, oh crap, he's doing photography. Okay. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't it was realize. awesome, dude. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, I saw you. T- uh, it was my buddy. Not my buddy. I shouldn't say my buddy. It's because he's from Pine Bush, New York, which a bunch of my buddies are from. Uh, AJ yeah. Dona. Yeah, he posted yeah. a thank you in it. Yeah. And I'm like, dang, like, all right. And like, how yeah. dude was that? That must have been pretty sick. It was an awesome year. So. This is a ton of travel, but like the amount of stuff you get to learn and you get to hang out with the dudes and you get to build relationships with these guys. And so it was really cool. Like I got to meet AJ um, at Champlain and just really cool to meet all those guys and like hang out with them. And I learned some really cool tricks that I can't share. <laughs> I know. Because, like, you can't. Top they're like pro yeah. secrets and these guys would kill me if I shared any of them. So. Oh, I bet. I mean, I know you can't share secrets, but any, like, stories kind of stuff that, you know, that come to mind? Um, oh, so it was really cool to see Casey. So I had a couple events where guys did really, really well. 
pretty much every event, like one of the guys would make the top 20. But um, the very first event of the season, Nick LeBrun, who's from yeah. Louisiana, almost won on Rayburn. So yeah. I, I was down there for that. And like just getting to travel with these guys and, and see the emotion that goes into it, I didn't realize I was traveling with very established pros or guys that have like understand the business side a ton of, of like the whole situation of everything about it. So I don't have like any crazy stories with these guys are like sleeping out of their trucks, but like they're very established and like business minded. And it's a very business oriented thing for them. Like when they're down there, there's like no games. Yeah. They're like fish and they're just like not playing around. Yeah, no. Yeah. I will tell you one thing that surprised me is guys will like go into practice in almost every event, like guys are ordering baits. Like they'll go to practice and they'll like pr- figure out what they need. By the end of practice, they'll be like overnighting tackle warehouse orders to their house because they'll like figure something out that they need and they have unbelievable amounts of tackle. I can only imagine. Yeah. I'm so, very jealous of a lot of these guys little tackled garages. <laughs> I didn't I didn't realize like that side of it on the other side it was hard to see some of the guys that are like struggling throughout the year mm-hmm. like dude i need to cash a check or aj sligona for example like knew he needed to finish in the top 10 on champlain and was like i need to have a good finish here if i want to fish next year yeah so it's he did. really eye-opening and those guys were like put a lot on the line to be there oh yeah AJ so, got eighth, didn't he? Yeah. Eighth and ninth, yeah. He did yeah. pretty well. He did awesome. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of guys, they're very, they seem very professional. I mean, like Nick LeBrun, you mentioned, I'm pretty sure, isn't he a rookie? Because he just came from the yeah. Coastas, right? Yeah. Yeah, he, did, he crushed the Coastas. Um, yeah, he crushed it. He uh, fished the BFL, won the BFL All American. Yeah. And he finished fourth last year in the Cup. And then he finished, well, he, he was second place after day one of the cup this year. He did pretty dang good with the uh, yeah. year for his first year. Yeah. He was usually, most tournaments, he was in the top 20. He was in the talks of all of it. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was crazy. It was it, awesome, though. There's some, there's those guys on that, that tour that you just know are going to do well every single year. Like, <laughs> yeah. Martin, you know, Dudley, Thrift. I mean, Thrift, he's going to catch him everywhere. I know. Um, where he goes, except for the Potomac River, he kind of stunk it up there. <laughs> I, I do have a funny story about Brian Thrift. So I was down there for the cup, and I was following around some of the guys. Well, I was shooting some stuff, and um, Brian Thrift had pulled up on the final day, like at the weigh-in, right? So basically, when you have a camera, you can walk around anywhere you want. It seems like, dude, literally, like I just didn't have a media badge, just walked to the back of the arena. And, yeah. like, was standing in the back there when he pulled up. Well, when he got out of his truck, now, everyone that watched live knew that he had a pretty good shot that he was going to win the event. Yeah. But he gets out of the truck and he's just like, man, I think, yeah, you know, Brian Thrift, man, I think I lost this event. You know, like, I think I screwed it up again. And I'm like, nah, dude. I, I Like, he was talking to the lady from Fitzgerald Rods, but I'm like, no, dude, you, I think you have this one. And, like... So being able to see that side of it and then like kind of again with the camera being able to go wherever you want, I basically followed Brian Thrift like on stage. So oh, <laughs> like I have this shot I never posted, but um, it's like a shot over his shoulder as he's walking onto the stage to go like carry his fish to the boat. So it, it was a really special year. It was awesome. That's probably gold. Oh my yeah. gosh. It was awesome because Brian Thrift is one of those guys like growing up, always one of the people that you idolize or I idolized. And like I look at him and see how he carries himself and how well he fishes and just the humility he has. And I'm like, dude, that is he's he's the man. Yeah. So. And, and there's a lot of guys you can say that for, but it's just like you need. Obviously, I I don't know a lot just because I've only seen what media or his page or people have wrote in articles about him have said. Yeah. But like watching lives and seeing how like he goes into strategy. Like if you look at the front deck of his boat, you can see how organized. <laughs> no. Like 
you can just tell from that first off. And then when he ta- like they do interviews with him and the way he talks, like they'll try to like get him to budge and like you know say something that's like a, that might come off as egotistic or something. But he's like stays humble. And he goes, I don't know, I just gotta go catch him kind of thing. Yeah. And like that's res- like highly respected, especially I feel like anybody in bass fishing at all respects the heck out of that guy just because he catches yeah. him everywhere. He puts in so much work. I think it was his wife that was put out something after he won the cup saying like. He doesn't give himself enough credit. He always beats himself up, even if he doesn't win. Kind of, <laughs> even if he does win, he's like, yeah, "I should have done this still." But it's like, it's, it's bass fishing. You're gonna go wrong at some point in the day. Like, he's the man. Oh he's yeah. The man. If there's, there's so many of those guys that are so good. But like, if there's a guy that's on point and prepared every single time, it, he's he's your man for sure. Yeah. I know. I do want to know, like, if I could ask him one thing, it's like, dude, how do you keep the front deck of your boat so organized? <laughs> so you have 20 rods, you have 10 rods on each side. Yeah. Like, how do, how are they never like crisscross? They're like always perfect. He's got to have OCD. Oh like, man. Like, to the max. like, even when I set a rod down, it will like crisscross. I'm like, that's good. Like if I try to keep my deck or front deck organized, it doesn't stay like that. I would love to go in his house and just throw laundry everywhere and see how he reacts. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> just see what he does. Well, like, if I was the cameraman and he's on his boat, I would totally take a rod and just tweak it and just see what he does, see how he yeah. reacts. To it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I feel like you would. Oh, that's funny though. But then you look at like David Dudley, who just, like does just as well, but his boat's just like a madness. It's, it's just mess, chaos. Dude. organized. His boat yeah. is a mess. <laughs> but I will tell you. So here's the secret that I. He didn't tell me this. Like, I think it's pretty obvious. But one thing he'll do is let's say he's fishing with um, a certain shaky head, right? And he's got he's got it set up a certain way. He'll take those shaky heads and he'll get them all rigged up and then hook them in the front deck of his carpet, like right above his trolling motor. Where you wouldn't put your foot anyways, right? But so I'm pretty sure he makes some modifications to his, his some of his hooks. Like rather than go dig through his box, you can just reach down, grab it, and retie it, and then put a worm okay. on it. They're like all right there. Oh no! No, I would never think about that. But he's so much about efficiency. He'll dye worms before, like the morning of the tournament, when he's sitting at the boat dock. Yeah, that's I think what makes him and Thrift and all these other guys so good is just efficiency and making the right decisions. And, I think, yeah, you think he put that in one of his videos where he's, like, the night before, he's he's putting them all into, like, the dye or whatever scent he is, pulling it back in the bag, yeah. putting zip blocks and everything, like, the night before, like, it's like a bag, like, 30 worms. Like, I think it was Chickamauga where he's yeah. just, like, throwing, like, 40 worms out there. I will I tell you, the, dude, Chickamauga, he went... Is that the one he won? He, no, uh, I mean, no. Cox won that, right? Yeah, Cox won that. But he was throwing a specific... Um, I don't know if it was a Senko or not, but he was throwing a specific worm and he ran out. And so after day three, he was like looking for a bag of worms. So he would like, he called up all the tackle shops and like they had the gambler version and they had the yum version and they had like four or five different versions. He's like, no, if it's not this version, it doesn't work right. He's so specific about his baits. And so like, you might see him and be like, dude, you're so unorganized. I'm like, no, no. organized chaos. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't blame them because there's certain brands like, I mean, I used to work at Field and Stream and there's guys that come in and they'd be like looking at a, a, like a Yamamoto versus a Yum. I'm like, oh, it's the same thing, just different price. And while, yes, yeah, nine bucks for a pack of Yamamoto Senkos is pretty outrageous, the, the sync rate yeah. is completely different between different brands. So I don't blame them for like saying, no, it's got to be this way. I mean, because when you make never- that, like he did. There's also uh, an interview he did, David Dudley did with Bass Talk Live, where yeah. he, it's a great interview. If you haven't listened to it, check it out, listen to it. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I love his videos too, like uh, a lot of his informative, like information yeah. kind of things, where he explains like how to read different contours on a lake and how you approach them to how to, and, like what you throw to fish and kind of thing. I love yeah. that. Like. Um, I'll be sitting there cranking out work and I'll just have that like going in my, my headphones, just kind of listening to it. Almost like he's doing his own podcast type of thing. But it's cool how he brings up certain maps and be like, all right, when I'm first approaching a lake, this is how I'll hit it. This is what I'll throw. This is what to look for. Like, you don't he's, see a lot of that. And it's pretty cool. He's so smart. 
Oh yeah, I mean, when you gotta be angle of the year four times, you gotta be pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. For real. Yeah, dude, that must have been an unbelievable experience doing that. Uh, it was awesome. LW for sure. It was awesome. Man. If uh, I got kind of a curious question. So if you could do, if you could follow somebody from either Bass or like MLF, to like. You had to like an awesome opportunity to follow a bunch of these guys and photograph, like do photography for, uh, for them. What, like, what angler would you want to follow that's not on FLW? Just oh, not on FLW. Not on FLW. Just one guy. Okay, one from Bass and one from MLF. Ooh. Um. Oh man, that's a great question. Yeah. From Bass. I would really like to follow. I want to say fighter, but that's like too yeah, obvious. Okay. But like fighter, right. fighter is like the dude. He is, yeah. He is. He's but the man. Fighter's the man. So I, I would say fighter from Bass, and then from MLF. MLF is weird because like I don't really. Now I will say I don't envy their style. Like I don't like the idea of going out and catching as many fish as possible. So it changes like who I would want to follow around because some guys yeah. are really good at that style and some guys are not great at that style yet. Yeah. Um, it's a hard one. That's a hard one. I, I kind of want to follow. One thing I realized this year is I kind of want to follow guys that do things unorthodox, right? Or like are very tackle specific. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why I almost don't want to choose fighter. Maybe Zeldane or someone that throws like big, big swim baits, but maybe Ike, Ike or Aaron Martins. Like I oh. think both of those dudes are kind of like weird yeah. and they Talk do things a little bit different. Yeah. 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 About another guy who's Aaron Martins, crazy organized. And crazy. Ike is like emotion, raw emotions there. I think yeah. They just posted something on his Instagram of uh, like saying like I can't remember that caption, but he like he missed a fish and just screams. I don't know if you saw that one, but it was, it's, I'm that made me laugh. Uh, you just, I, I don't think I've seen it yet. Oh, dude. Okay, you got to pull it up right now. All right. Yeah, you have your phone. Yeah, it's on Ike's. Yeah, on his on his page, the Mike Iconelli live or Ike live. Is it on Facebook or is it on Instagram? It's on Instagram. Oh, it's on the Ike Live show. Oh, yeah. Here it goes again. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> the motion is it's hilarious. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like any other guy would probably be like, oh, dang. But then he was just... <laughs> screams. That was pretty funny. That's yeah, funny. I don't. I'm trying to think for for Bass, obviously Fighter is probably one of the coolest dudes to follow, just because like his character and personality. But uh, I might have to go with uh, Jamie Hartman, who just won on Cayuga, just because he's a uh, he's a town boy for me. Like he's from New York, fishes Canisius, my home lake, and everything. That's awesome. Right with him, but then uh, dude, I have to go with Gerald Swindle. The dude, oh. the dude is hilarious. The G yeah. knowledge, oh. Uh, I'm dying every video he's talking about that especially the one where he's like uh never go on a boat with uh, a guy that's got a clean deck like find a guy that's got a dirty front deck and he, yeah <laughs> yeah he's like he is, he's so funny man he's just so like all over the place too oh yeah <laughs> well, i don't know if i could deal with that i'm like very like i'm not serious when i fish i joke around constantly but like oh. I don't, I'm not quick enough. So he would say something and I'd be like, I don't even know how to respond to this. Right? <laughs> hey, you just like that. Whereas like for me, like I'm exactly the same way. You'd say something and be like, yeah, it's pretty funny. And then an hour later, I'd have a comeback. For yeah, that. exactly. Too late now. But <laughs> exactly. But he's also one of those guys where I, I kind of want to say he's technically unorthodox because I don't think he's getting away from his roots of going after big fish. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say he had a bad year. But I don't think he was at the top because I don't think he was going after the numbers necessarily. I think he was going after weight. I, was, yeah. I think because if you talk about it, he's just like I like. He's like I like to junk fish. I like to go after and I like to flip. I like throw crankbaits. 
I like to power fish. If I can't do that, I don't want to do it. Um, so I think it's – Well, that's like all these guys that did well, they did well on like small spots, but they did well on like little areas. Mm-hmm. They didn't junk fish. They didn't go down the bank. Like when you think about guys that catch big fish a lot, like a lot of times unless you're on a ledge fishing tournament, you're not catching them out of like one area, right? Yeah. Like, or you're not catching them out of like a whole bunch of different areas. They're typically – You have one spot, one or two. Yeah, one or two spots, you catch a lot of fish, but you don't catch a lot of big fish that way. Like, you have to kind of rotate spots or rotate areas or, yeah. I don't know. So. Yeah, I mean, talk about one spot, Edwin Evers, holy crap. Did, did you watch that full tidbit of just one after another? It's ridiculous, it's yeah. unreal. Yeah. So as much as I don't like this concept of, like, catching smaller fish, like, that is unreal. Like, to catch 60 yeah. fish a day in the middle of summer in August, like – that doesn't happen. <laughs> it's, no. It's crazy. And I will agree. I agree, but I disagree. I, I agree with I don't like that every fish counts, but I in I I like I like but I don't like the concept of throwing them back right away. I like it because obviously it's better for the fish, keeps them healthier. Yeah. But also like bringing back a fat sack, there's nothing better. Like there's no better feeling coming back to the ramp where you're like, yeah, I caught them. But like and holding them up on stage. I mean, I've ever done that, but like, you know, bring I'm with it, you though. Fish, so well, like, it's a, it's a struggle. But I I like the concept of catch and release, immediate catch and release, right? So like, yeah. you catch them, you weigh them, release them. But mm-hmm. I see the value of driving traffic to a venue of having an actual weigh in. So yeah. like, I think bass needs to realize that there are ways that they can get. Combine the two systems, sort of like what they did with Texas, uh, Toyota Texas Bass Fest this year, where you like just weigh in one big one. Mm. Like, I really like that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, and you actually, um, I think the tournament trail is by me, I think it's called Rochester Bass Masters, where it's like just like a regional Bassmaster League. Yeah. Um, and what they did actually this year. Um, they had a tournament on Cayuga. And I think it was, I want to say April, March or April. And what they did is they did MLF style, but you only your, your biggest five counted. So everybody got, everybody was given the same scale. And uh, so they were all, I think all like the Rapala tournament scales that added them up and called for them. Yeah. Um, and, oh, dude, like, I think the winning bag was 31 pounds on Cayuga. Like Jeez, it was. Oh, Pete. Yeah. Uh, Cayuga shows out. Um, Dude, that lake, like, I didn't realize how good that lake was oh until God. the bass mess went there, and they're, like, smashing them. And that's in August. Imagine what it is in pre-spawn. It's the, literally, I kid you not, um, for some reason, not many guys fish it that much in the pre-spawn. Yeah. Like, it's it's very simple to find fish there. The, the numbers are there. That They're so healthy because they have so <laughs> much bait. Like, I tell you, that's my favorite lake in the world, and I had a – like, I didn't have to get to fish it too much this year, but that was uh, – I had the craziest experience where I won I won a kayak tournament out there. Uh, there was 40-something guys, but I my winning fish were in the first half an hour of the day. I caught my first – my best – my biggest three fish in that first half an hour. I didn't – technically, I didn't have to fish for the rest of the day. Uh, it's one of, I have one of the, the snippets in one of my YouTube videos, but it's like – Dude, I was in 10 foot of grass um, about a month and a half ago. Saw a laker chasing after my chatterbait in 10 foot of grass. Like, it's like That's ridiculous. Lake, so yeah. many crazy things happen. Like, a guy in that same tournament caught a small bass and had caught a laker that ate his bass. Like, the, the lake just goes out in so many ways. Um, and it's just like, it's one of those lakes where you see an area that looks good and it's actually good. Like, I feel the- like that's how northern fisheries are, like, for the most part, right? You obviously have some really tough lakes and some lakes that suck, yeah. but I know talking to Alex and talking to Caleb and talking to a bunch of guys that came up to fish, Mikey included, they're like, dude, if a spot looks good on the lake, it's probably at least decent, right? Like, you can go catch a fish there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not fishing on it. Yeah. It's, what's cool about New York fishing, and I mean, really, I don't know, I'm sure you, you definitely could speak better for Michigan um, than I could. Um, is that you can literally, it's not like the South where you're stuck to a bunch of different, you know, like a certain different like techniques. Yeah. Uh, 
like maybe Gunnersville, you could probably do everything. But like uh, New York, if you wanted to go fish a ledge, Cayuga's got ledges. That's what yeah. some the guys were doing. Uh, flipping bite, you know, if you want to go up for smallmouth, deep smallmouth, you want to like literally <laughs> anything you wanted has that whole array. Like it's, it's the same way here. And dude, we have so many lakes, right? Like those, oh they, they, they have these giant, massive, world renowned lakes because they have them on all these tournaments Pickwick, Wheeler, Wilson, Gunnersville, you know, all the big TBA lakes. Right? But these are massive lakes. We have like, I don't know about New York. I'm pretty sure you guys have the same thing, but lots of smaller lakes that you can really do a lot of different things on. Uh-huh. Right? So, like, I have a lake where I can go catch smallmouth 10 minutes away from the lake. I can go flip the frog and catch big largemouth on. Like, yeah. It's crazy. Oh, it's exactly, yeah, it's exactly the same. Um, I remember I was so overwhelmed because uh, people know I'm here. I moved to Indiana for the fall. And I remember. Yeah. I, reaching out to you I'm like dude I don't know where to go there's so many places like where do I go to catch anything like, I just want to catch something um it, it's 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 crazy the different fisheries that you can go to and there, there's a lake that uh I was actually going to ask you about on here um not like name specifics or anything but like yeah. uh you had mentioned because you fished there with uh with Gene Jensen and you fished there with Mikey and you guys had a video but um the smallmouth had a yeah. I wanted to bring that up because I remember you mentioning it, and I wasn't fully, like, I didn't understand it fully. And I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about that. Like, what's going on? Like, what is largemouth disease or something like that? Yeah, so it's it's called largemouth bass virus, and I haven't been back up there since I fished there with Fluke. But um, essentially, what it is is it's a bass virus that comes through lizards, um, salamanders, creek. It comes basically through these small creeks, right? So that's how it gets transferred. Or it comes through people's live wells. Like when people live well fish and they don't clean their live wells and then they pump the water into a different body of water. Yeah. Like fish can get it. But essentially when, when Mikey and Caleb and myself fish this lake, these fish were super giant, super clean, super healthy, and like really fat. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Alex, yeah, like like dumb. Yeah. Like silly. <laughs> Well, Alex and Gene and myself went up there this year, and I had heard a little bit about it, right? Like, just a little bit, that this lake might have it. Well, we got up there, and every single fish we caught had these big sores on them, like open wounds, and were really skinny, and were just, like, nasty looking. And I don't know the full story of it. I've I've heard from, like, one guy that went up there and fished that he thinks the fish look normal, but... I'm not going to go back up there. It's a long ways away um, to go try and catch some fish that are probably sick. So yeah, it's really sad. It's kind of like the only real way I know to get rid of the virus is to like kill the lake off and then basically repopulate it. But that's sad. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this was like a trophy fishery. So at that rate, it's more of just let nature run its course. I mean, yeah. at that point, like there's so many different things that, conservationists like wildlife uh, services i know they have the right intentions in mind um but like sometimes you just gotta let nature do its thing like it sucks to see for us anglers but sometimes the best way to you know to let things rebuild is to let it happen through just natural selection uh, yeah and like one thing i oh, i hate it i absolutely hate it and like the ba- bass master guys on Cayuga saw the same thing um is they the like what we call our fish and wildlife in New York is called DEC, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation. Okay. They, they will go in shallow and chop up all the grass because it appeases to the the, the yes. on owners because they want to swim. But that destroys so much of you know an ecosystem. Like and it it's just makes it happy. It's and it's it's just oh, it's so gross and it just. It's the same way here, and in my opinion, it kind of like ruins fisheries. It's mm-hmm. the same thing as that copper sulfate that they spray. Like if you see guys out there like spraying stuff, it's copper sulfate. Well, essentially, what it does is it's a heavy liquid, and it sinks down to the bottom. And when they spray that on your lakes, it kills that grass from the roots, right? Well, now fish are eating crayfish and other things that are living on the bottom or living in the grass. Yep. So fish get sick, and so it's just a vicious cycle, man. Yeah, it. I have, we have one of these lakes uh, by me. It's called Honey Oint. 
And like, if you want to go catch a hundred fish in three hours, that's the lake you go to. Yeah. Not really. You might catch like one four pounder in a mix of like eighty one pounders. Yeah. But like, you, that lake is awesome to fish from you know the winter until july and then they go through and they chop everything up and then they spray a bunch of stuff and then the lake's literally like a like you'd see like on that like in a cartoon like that radioactive green it's like what it looks like Dude, it's so it's just it's like same. Wow, like why like the same happens here and the, like people can't swim in it like so yeah, the whole purpose of the whole purpose of chopping and spraying the grass is so people can like enjoy the water sports and <laughs> But then people can't swim. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous, dude. Like, what's the point? Save yourself money. Put it. Put that tax money somewhere else. You know. Well, it's the same thing that's going on in Okeechobee, right? Like all those big oh, efforts. God. And it's ridiculous. So. And that's what's causing all the red tide out in the ocean. Like they had yeah. to kill off. My grandparents lived down there in Boca Grande. And they were like, we try to go to the beach. This was months ago. I think it was last. I think it was this past winter. Where it was literally like you go to the beach, you start coughing because it was so bad, and there's dead <laughs> everywhere. It was like it was sad. Like my grandmother, she sent me a video of dead dolphins on the beach because there's no oxygen from it because it's all coming from Okeechobee. And it yeah. was like, just stop, just let nature be. Just you know, it, the grass will go away once it gets colder. You can handle it. You're from Florida. You're you're fine. Yes. You're in okay. warm. Just relax. <laughs> like yeah. Mikey I, is like a big advocate yeah, of like yeah. that whole thing too. Yeah. And that was a big discussion we had was talking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. He's so smart about it too. Like, yeah, for me, it's like my own opinion. I'm like, this is really dumb, but he's yep. like very educated on it. Yeah. I'll say this is really dumb and then give you 13, you know, reasons and stuff. Yes. Very intellectual about that. And that was pretty cool. Yeah. There's, oh my God, there's the issues we could, we could go on forever about, but, uh, kind of getting back to more what you kind of do and everything. Um, one thing I, I keep looking at the screen just to make sure I'm still in picture and it's it's good, but <laughs> you see this merch here, you know, it's one of, one of your staples right now. You want to tell us a little about it? Yeah, so I had this concept. Well, dude, it's been like a long time coming. So when I hit, like, was growing pretty quick, at 10,000, I told everyone, okay, I'm going to come up with merch. Well, like at 10,000, I was like, yeah. I'll, I'll tell a little, little bit more about my story in a bit, but yeah, I came up with some merch at around 15,000 and just having fun with it. So I thought it was a cool logo, um, play on no, like the no wake signs you see on the lake. And so I want to come up with these stickers that just say nation. Yeah. They're like, I like, uh, not promote vandalism, he's, he's but, yeah. but <laughs> put it up on the no wake signs out there. So, um, but no, so, yeah, drop some merch and just been having fun with it. So, yeah, I mean, do you have that linked anywhere? Like, when um, file kind of thing? Yeah, uh, you guys can check it out at brnoakfishing.com slash shop or just brnoakfishing.com and go to the shop page. Um, and you can check out all the merch. I also have it linked through Teespring. So, if you search teespring.com and then you go search for like no wake nation apparel, it'll pop up. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, these these things are comfortable as heck. I mean, yeah. pretty pair with that Afco shirt you got on over there. Thank you, man. And speaking of that Afco and the Monster Bass, you want to tell us a little about uh, your your pro staffs and whatnot? Yeah. So Monster Bass is a big one. This is kind of what I was going to touch on, but um, I started with Monster Bass in March of this year. I left a corporate job. Basically, left like uh, some people what some people would consider like a dream job in corporate to try and work in the fishing industry. So Monster Bass is essentially a regionalized subscription box, similar to like Lucky Tackle Box or Mystery Tackle Box. We have five different regions. So you have the North, Northeast, or Midwest, Northeast, South, Pacific Northwest, and then the California region. Mm -hmm. like California is so unique, you have to give them like a whole yeah. region. <laughs> because You're by yourself. Yeah. yeah, that's basically how it is too. Yeah. So, we have those five regions and we handpick baits each month to go in the box. So the big argument we had all the time at Lucky was, man, I'm not getting like the baits that I want in my box. Well, the reason is it's just a random set of baits that you're getting. Yeah. yeah. Now we wanted to really get specific and, and handpick the baits that go in the boxes. And so I'm picking out baits, Alex Rudd's picking out baits, um, and a couple other guys are helping us pick out baits. So we have actually high quality products in the boxes. So it's it's fun. It's a big learning experience and uh, it's been awesome. 
Oh, I bet. And Small Moth Crush is with Monster Bass, too, as well, yep. right? Yep. So you guys have a couple more different people that I've seen. Um, Nick, the informant it's... fisherman, is with us. Um, oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We have Shea Baker. Um, He's pretty good. Yeah. Justin Fortune. Austin Redding. Uh, Extreme Outdoorsman is with us. We have a we have a ton of guys with us now, but yeah, those yeah. are the awesome, yeah. And yeah. you, uh, yeah, you and Dylan, you guys are pretty close. Yeah, Dylan, cool. Dylan's a good dude. Yeah, yeah, he put up a nice, nice Saint Clair video. Yeah, he smashed him. <laughs> I was out there like the day before, and he absolutely wrecked him because that day was not easy. Oh, I, I don't, yeah, I don't doubt that. I think he was just, he was just what, just he was just hucking a tube the whole day or something like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, talk a little about um, the AFCO as well. I understand you're with them too. Yeah, so there are a couple companies I'm working with now. Um, I'm with Luz. I'm with AFCO. Um, Onyx Life Jackets is a big one for me. I've been with them for a long time. And then Garmin. I've, really, I've been with Garmin for two years now, two and a half years. But yeah. Garmin is like a big player. If you guys watch like any of my videos, I'm sure you've seen it. But like... Live scope and pan optics has changed the way I, I fish. So yeah, Garmin is like huge and they've been a big um, supporter of the channel and it's been awesome. But and that was one of my favorite videos you've had. And I'll be honest, I've been watching your videos for a long time, but that one video you had where you're with Alex and you guys are like you're giving the the <laughs> of the pan optics, watching the small moth come up and then you guys catch him. My yeah. mom was absolutely blown and i'm sitting there i'm on the couch we have it on the big tv and i'm watching it with my father <laughs> and this i've been bugging him for a while about like you know I, I want a nice graph for my kayak because all i have on my is like the little garmin striker four it's like got this yeah. you know the sonar which you know it does a job it's accurate but at the same time looking at my dad i'm like you know the echo maps have this you know they're under <laughs> on about a grand like um and i'm bugging him like see, see look at that like see what you can do like uh, yeah, dude, it's it's he, unreal tech, right? And like, I could tell you about it. And here's my problem: I told Garmin this. I'm like, dude, I can tell as many people as I want about like pan and optics. Tell you it helps me catch fish, but like until you're on my boat and you like see it happen, it's very hard to explain like how effective it is. Well, I think that video was oh an eye opener for some people who were like, oh shoot, like yeah, I've seen it with crappie and I've seen it with whatever, but like that. Dude, this Dude, it was it's awesome. unreal. Like, I got to, we sold at Field Stream, like I mentioned earlier, I worked there as like a summer job in between years at college. Yeah. And uh, I I was, we had, we got Garmin units in and like the, we had one Echo Map that had the pan optics. And it was cool because I would, when we had that in, we got, we got that in and I'm sitting there, I'm reading about it. I looked it up and I read on articles and I'm sitting there, I'm like, it seems very simple and easy to read. And I understand the concept, but I'm like, I'm still confused on how the heck to use yeah. it. Yeah. And then I saw your videos. I'm like, holy crap! And I had I I have to thank you because I made a bunch of sales. I literally showed, <laughs> showed customers your video, um, because they're asking they're like, oh, what's the pan optics do? Because they're looking at the Garmin units. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, okay, just watch this video. Like, I can tell you what I know and I can tell you how it works, but like, you just have to watch it. And they're yeah. looking at it. And they're like, yeah. Like they they're like, okay, it's, let me get one. And just, it's amazing, dude. I mean, it's like crazy tech. It's it's yeah. crazy tech. Like mind blowing it was awesome to like watch literally see your bait and watching the smallmouth school up at it it was dude it was yeah. totally, like wolf packs it was nuts yeah it's I, so a little bit of background on that video so what's really interesting about this lake is it's essentially a big bowl right like just imagine a glacier like came through and just decided to melt one area oh, right dude that's, that's you're talking new york too yeah yes it's All the same is. thing just <laughs> a bowl well, yep. these fish don't get on anything, right? They just like hang out on the thermocline. So like in the middle of summer, these big smallmouth are hard to catch because they'll just chill in the middle of the water column. Mm -hmm. Well, last summer I was out fishing and I realized, well, the fish are starting to like blow up all over, but I couldn't figure out like how to pinpoint these fish. Well, I started spinning around pan optics and I'm like, oh shoot, like I can actually just wait for them to start to come up and just cast to them. And mm -hmm. that's basically how I, how I figured that pattern out. But like I told my buddy, without pan optics, it's not possible to catch these fish. Or not like, maybe you can catch them, but it's a lot more difficult and it's a lot more random. Yeah. And that's one of the things, like my home lake, Canisius, I, I love it to death. But once you hit that 
July mark where the water temps above 80. It is so hard to catch fish. And we had a weird, very weird transition uh, from spring to summer this year that not a lot of grass grew. Um, yeah. had, we got really hot and it gave, it was really sunny, calm, like the ideal conditions for grass to grow. And the grass grew up and then it went back to 40s, low 40s for like two weeks, killed everything. Yeah. And like the every Tuesday we had like what's called a working man tournament out in there. Um, you looked at the weights from that for the first like two months and it's like not normal. Like usually to win these, you have to get 13, 14 pounds for three fish and guys were putting in nine pounds. Like we're like, what is, what guys are coming back? The guys that are hammers out there. Like I've fished that lake for a long time, but guys that have fished that for 20 plus years, they, they come back dumbfounded. They're like, I don't know where they are. And that's like, but then until somebody realized they're out in the middle of the damn lake because they don't have anything else to relate to besides yeah. docks. And for some reason, they wouldn't come up shallow. Um, and literally, like, guys were like, yeah, we would, just side, we would just graph until we found a school. And you'd graph to find the school again. But, like, that, that's a game changer. Absolute game changer. Yeah. And it, it's the same way up here. Like, similar to what you guys had, we had the same thing. Like, it just got cold. Or it got really warm for, like, two weeks. Fish came up real shallow. Like, they were getting ready to spawn. And then it got cold. And it just stayed cold. Like, yeah. right back Yeah. yeah. And so we dealt with the same thing. Like our bite is still really weird. Like I don't yeah. think it's where it should be, but it's been a weird to... season for sure. Yeah, it, it's been odd. I, I hope that it means we're gonna have a long season though. Like I hope I'll be fishing into December this year. That fall fall bite should be fire. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I've been talking to uh, I can't remember his name. Jackson something. Jackson fishing, I think. Uh, I fish in a lot of Lake Michigan, and uh, that's where I've heard there's some some bigs because I don't I can't drive the four hours to St. Clair for because I don't really get many days off. Yeah, uh, I really want to because that's like top five bucket list fisheries I want to go to. Um, but I'm about to find some Lake uh, Lake, uh, Lake Michigan spots to uh, fish from shore. But like like my the first uh, lake, and I told you about it when I came here was this small little lake that literally looked like I was in Florida. I'm sitting there like. Indiana, I picture like, <laughs> this is not what I picture. Lily pad fields everywhere. Like, yeah. I feel like I should have 65 pound braid and you know one and a half ounce you know flipping weights and go to town. But uh, I literally sat at the launch of this place and it was just like one after another. Like, it was pretty cool. But the all yeah. little, little, little dinky things. And I'm like, okay, I want like a Michigan, Indiana. I want a stud. Like, I need to catch one over three pounds. Yeah, pound. it's so tough too, man. Yeah. It's like a lot of people think just go fishing and you're going to catch like a big one. But like a big one is three and a half, four pounds. Especially up three here. Three and a half to five pounds is like a big one up here. Yeah. And like I was talking to Mike and he's like, every time I go out, I need to catch one big one. And like a big one, like a decent one for me is like five, six pounds. And I'm like, dude, five, six pounds. I go nuts over that up here. Like <laughs> yeah. those, you don't come across those every single day. Like it's, it's very it's funny. So he had come up here last spring. So not this past spring, spring prior. And one thing he told me is like, dude, I know you have some good largemouth fisheries, but like we, this was when he busted 49 pounds. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, we cannot go fish for largemouth when I'm up there. He's like, we have to fish for smallmouth. Yeah. And so like, that's what we focus <laughs> on. Right. But like to well, yeah, him. Here you can get those giant smallmouth and you can find them more. Yeah. Than but like to me, I'd be like happy with three and a half pound largemouth. Yeah. <laughs> to him, it's like, nah. Yeah. yeah nah. He, it's like, eh. yeah, yeah. He, he's tossing back four or five pounders like it was nothing. Yeah, that was that video is unbelievable. The forty nine. Yeah. I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably put the poles down and just be like, I would, I would quit. I'd probably just sell them. I've yeah. done everything. <laughs> yeah. Nah, he's. I really respect his drive and a lot of other anglers' drives to like just keep learning no matter what they do. And that's yeah. something I strive for myself too, and it's it's pretty awesome to see for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I definitely, dude, I definitely got to get up to St. Clair at some point because I just need to at least see it. I just need to be by it. Just to say St. I've been there. St. Like, Clair is definitely a bucket list place. Oh, yeah, for a lot of people. Yeah. Especially if you're a smallmouth fanatic. Like, I'll take a two-pound smallmouth over a three-pound, four-pound largemouth any day. Yes, yeah. They just, oh, just, ah. Like, guys hate on drop shotting all the time. They're like, yeah, I hate finesse fishing. Dude, something about... Light line and those smallmouth that just like <laughs> me up. I agree. It's like a frog bite. It's, it's 
cool. I'm the same way. And speaking about like different lakes and whatnot, if you had to say you had a favorite lake, uh, oh. one. <laughs> I like I like Lake Huron a lot. That was that's bad. where I spend a lot of my like that's where I spend a lot of my time, anyways. But the Lake Huron or like any of the Great Lakes, I like the ability to go out and think to myself like maybe no one has ever touched this place, really. Right? Like, mm. No one has ever found this rock pile that I'm fishing that has fish on it. Like that to me is really unique and cool. Oh yeah, cause it's massive. Yeah, it's like huge, and a lot of guys were walleye fishermen. Um, but like inland, largemouth, I really like. Uh, there are a couple home lakes that I have around here that I like dock fishing. So that's pretty sweet. Yeah, I I need to spend more time out in the Great Lakes. I literally only been on Erie once, and it was on a very slow day with my buddy Alex. But he still like I kid you not, my luck was so bad that day. I lost <laughs> so many baits. Like we were, it it was it was the most intimidating but awesome fishery I've been on because we. I fished out of Buffalo Safe Harbor. We launched out of there, yeah. and it's next to the Niagara River. Well, for those who don't know, Niagara River draws current like it's unbelievable the current that it draws from there. Yeah. Um, and like he's got his trolling motor on 100, and we're fishing a current break, and he's on the entire time, and like we're fishing these like one ounce swim jig heads for these smallmouth, and like three pounders, I'm going nuts for, it. and he goes, oh that's nothing. He's tossing them back, and like I catch like a three and a half. And I'm like a kid thinking like, oh, it's a five pounder, like it's nuts. Yeah. My PB is only four nine for a smallmouth, and dude, we found this one offshore spot like miles, like ways away from shore, and we're drifting tubes in forty foot of water, and like he's on one side of the boat, I'm on the other. He catches five and then a five, and I'm like, I'm right there. Like, why can't why can't you just I don't know, it's, dude? It's, it's so like, like let's talk about that real quick. Is I think it's very interesting, the concept of like because it just happened on St. Clair. We're all drifting out of the same side of the boat and like I catch a big one and like my buddy would catch a decent one and the guy in the back of the boat would like not catch one. Like when I say we're drifting, like we're all drifting out of the same side, same drift. And I just think like fishing some of those drifts is like I would know like how to pop my bait if I felt it hit a rock so I didn't get hung. Or like I think there's little nuance things that do yeah. like set someone apart from being really good at catching fish drifting and someone like myself that's like decent at doing it yeah and it's just amazing to like see even something as simple as drifting a bait there's like nuanced things that you can do oh yeah for sure and like i want the, i i literally that same exact thought process i i went through that night um not that night because we were out on the lake from 5 until 8 p.m so i'd crash as soon as i got back <laughs> next day um i was sitting i was thinking about different things and it's like i've never drift that was the first time i ever drift fish before like finger like you, you just don't like you can do it but like there's way more effective ways to catch them yeah um so like that was kind of new to me but also i had 10 pound test he had six and then also i think what is a huge factor is because the great lakes especially around me i don't know if huron has the same way as goby fish like gobies are like their main source now yeah um are, are there gobies in huron yeah, yeah. Oh, so they, i didn't know they reached it's out like a, it's like a huge yeah yeah it's like it's just a ball of protein yeah. and there's no way for them to defend themselves so smallmouth they're all over it yeah but we both had tubes same same weight I think line. I think the line size may have had a small factor. Um, I don't think it was that big of a player. I think what it did was his had a small. Like we had the the green pumpkin with that white belly, and but I think the, the key different one. Uh, key difference was is his had a small purple fleck on it, and I think that's what did it. <laughs> I agree. I think, think I think there's like minuscule differences that make huge like yeah. impact. Yeah, and it's, yeah. like, that's one thing where I'm trying to dwell more into and I'm trying to research more because, like, in my bags of baits, I have – you can see I'm very straightforward. It's it's white and chartreuse, green pumpkin, black and blue. I really don't have much else. Like, I have a little bit of oaky crawl in there. But, like, I don't like to go with, like, a purple, lavenders and stuff like that. And, like, you see guys that will win off colors like that. But I'm like, I don't even – I would have never thought of using stuff like that. It's, it's weird. It's like – so. I, I'm kind of the same way, right? But, like, I've realized how regional some colors are. 
right? Like down in Rayburn, you have to have Rayburn red. Like you have to have reds and you have to have bright yellow or bright oranges. And like up here in the Midwest, jigs with blue in them do better than jigs with without blue. Or like, but even even though I, I say that, like jigs, I have a brown jig, I have a blue jig, or a brown jig, a green jig, and a black jig. Mm-hmm. Right, like those are my three jigs, and then tubes. I have the the goby colored du- or tube that I throw, and then I have like a perch ish colored yeah. tube that I throw, and a smoke, and like drop shot the same way. Like I'm so simple minded when it comes to that stuff. I focus more on like the presentation and like the way a bait acts in the water, or mm-hmm. you know, my line and how it impacts my bait and, and the other things. To me, color is like super secondary. I think fish are very aggressive, um, mm-hmm. just in general. And so, while it has a difference, I think all the other things are forefront. Oh uh, yeah, and it was, it was actually really interesting that day. But I can tell you what, I've never I've never been big about using tubes. Never got into it. Um, that day, I went after that day after I went and bought a lot of tubes and tube jigs because it's like okay, all right, this yeah. works. Um, but I like. As a joke, like I'm sitting there, I'm like, we had seen a bunch of shad getting busted on. We couldn't catch them on top water, and then so I'm like, okay, I have a drop shot set up. I so I a drop shot at a 2.8 high tech, and I'm like, I just yeah. dropped it down while I was dragging the tube. So I'm sitting there with two rods, and like, <laughs> so a drop shot rod was going off like crazy. So I kept catching like three, three and a half, and that was a blast. But like, yeah. he just kept pulling up giants, like, and he's Dude. like, he was cranking like a heavy rattle trap too, and it was. I'm trying to remember which one it was. I don't know if you know if he wants me to tell, but it was like yeah. it, you could literally it, we're fishing forty foot, he's yo yoing it off the bottom. You could hear the rattle. Like it was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And he I've been there. Giants, like absolute slobs. I can see the pictures afterwards. He just I and think, the, dude, I think it goes back to the thing you were saying though, right? Like yes, shad and bay fish eaters get big, but they don't get the same sort of big as goby eaters. Yeah. They just don't. It's, it's the just, same way on here on nuts for yeah. sure and i kind of not dwelling on that too if if i could ask you i mean um i know these are cruel questions because it makes you think a lot but like favorite technique if you could choose one to do oh uh, i feel crank, choose crank tech- baiting uh oh okay now you're thinking about <laughs> <laughs> i still think i'd choose crank baiting yeah I, I think it catches a lot of good ones and that's kind of very general i yeah. like deep cranking I really like deep crank. Yeah. Um, or fishing a jigger on docks. Those are my like two favorite ways to catch them. But really, like whatever they're gonna bite on this, I know this is so cliche, but whatever they're gonna bite on, I like to fish. So my least favorite way to fish, however, and I never pick up a stickworm, so I never pick up a senko. Like, yeah, I cannot tell you the last time I picked up a senko. Yeah. Um, and I don't like tune fishing. <laughs> I hate that's fishing. why I'm just recently getting into it because I never liked it. I hate want to like, this is boring. Um, but like, I don't know. I watched like a bunch of video of um, oh, what the heck's his name? I can't believe I'm blanking on this. He does a whole bunch of shows. He he works with uh, bass. So, yes, yes, stroking yeah. a jig, like learning from like he's doing. Yeah, never knew about stroking a jig until this year. My buddy Alex, he's like, yeah, go watch it if you want to learn how to really use a tube. Like, go watch his videos. He's, like, the master of using a tube. Yeah. Um, and it was, like, okay, I'll get into that. But, like, you go with, the, like, you talk about the Senko. Like, I hate throwing that. Um, but then again, I, <laughs> I always have one rigged up, especially tournament day, because, like, that is the, in my experience, is the best sight fishing bait. Like, if I see a giant shallow, I, <laughs> nine times out of ten, if I cast, like, if I have to make the right cast, it's, you're going to catch it. Yeah. Like, if something's gonna get it, I mean, I think if I tournament fished, it would be a different story. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, especially like, I mean, what's cool about the kayak fishing is like the live tournaments are fun. I only did one, but I did um, a couple month long tournaments. So it's like your best five for the month, and you're competing against everybody in the state, which is kind of cool. Sweet. So I technically, I, I was technically kind of tournament fishing, but really I was going fun fishing. If I, if I caught a big one, I'd put it down, but. Dude, like I always had one rigged up just because sight fishing. It, I haven't found anything that has beaten it. 
Although I've just recently started getting into big swim baits, so I might start switching over to that instead. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, my buddy screwed me over. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. like how you say that. That's so true, though. But that's like the best way to put it. Yeah. He just forced me into the addiction. He's, yeah. just, he's like, hey, I have a mag draft. Here you go. Have fun. And he goes, welcome. And I'm like, oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. For sure. But it's, ah, geez. I mean, that those are hard questions, too, favorite technique and everything. And, like, people hate me for it, but I love deep fishing, like, finesse. I don't know yes. why. But it's just because it takes a lot of strategy. I think, yeah. I think that's why I like it, because it can be challenging. I mean, sure, everybody loves top water. If you don't love top water, why are you fishing? Like, Yeah, top water's, top water's fun, but, like, to me, top water's so random, right? Like, I don't – it may not be. Like, I know there's ways to pattern top water fish, but I'm very – I love the strategy part of fishing. So, yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah. Because top water, you're just like you're scanning an area. You're not like, okay, fish are setting up here. How can I present it in them in this way? Why are they setting up there? Why is this bait working? But then top water, you're just like, okay, they're in this general area. Yeah, I'm gonna go throw this. Spook it's a good spook bait. It's a I'm good just bait. gonna work the spook until I get one to eat it, right? Like, yeah. And it's it's a good search bait. It's what a lot of guys will tell you for sure. Yeah. Um, and then frogs. Frogs makes a little bit more sense though. Because I mean, yeah. you can't throw them anywhere like you can a spook. Um, all right, so getting into home stretch here, I have my my two questions that I love asking everybody. Okay. And uh, I got I got chewed out in the last podcast by Mikey. He goes, "Screw you, dude, for asking these questions." Uh, <laughs> so I might feel the same way, <laughs> and I don't blame you. But I love the answers for him because it's like everybody is not guaranteed to be the same answer. Yeah. So you're going to dinner, and you can bring three people, any three people in the world. If you could bring three, <sighs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> you, do they have to be? Are they alive? What doesn't matter? Live, dead, like doesn't have to be fishing related or not. Oh, that's so. <laughs> it's, I have the answers that I'm thinking of, and I'm like, ah, but I can't say that because. I'm going to take, okay, so Kylie's out of the picture. My wife is out of the picture. Like, she doesn't <laughs> Don't count. This podcast. <laughs> yeah, she, she doesn't count. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to stick with only living people. Okay. I would take, <laughs> it's hard. I'll tell you a very, okay, so while I'm thinking, I'll give you a quick story. So I was, uh, we were in Oklahoma for Grand Lake and went out to dinner with Brad Holman, Todd Castledine, Russell Cecil, um, shoot, one more person, and then David Dudley. Oh, and dang. David Dudley is like crazy, dude. He's crazy. <laughs> crazy. Anyways, so, like he just he made, he made the top 10 he made the or no he made the top 20 and we were at dinner it's like nine o'clock well if you've watched david's videos like he'll go he would go raccoon hunting after dinner at like 11 o'clock at night when he had to fish the next day in the top in the top 30 yeah no joke raccoon what yes yeah, so we were in grand lake we we're at we we're in oklahoma and we're at this dinner, and first of all, David is just David, right? Like, David's just a goon. But we were sitting there, and he's like, dude, I think after this, I'm going to go walk around in the woods and look for some raccoons. And Brett's like, Brett, he's like, dude, you just made the top 30. you got to be up at, like, 4 o'clock. He's like, yeah, I won't even sleep tonight. Like, doesn't matter. I'm going to go coon hunting tonight. So after dinner, he got in his truck and went raccoon hunting. What? Like, to, did he actually kill anything, or did he just, like, look for I'm, him? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm but just, I just... Yeah, I'm I, I, that, was a very, that was a very interesting dinner that I had. That was probably the most interesting dinner I had all season. But, yeah. I can just picture so, him walk through the woods spotlighting for raccoons. I know. It would be... Yeah, he's, a, he's an interesting dude. Um, right, I'll make it easier. Two people. I'll make it easier. No, no. So, I need three, because I need to have a conversation. So... Okay. We're going to go with Brian Thrift. Okay. But I would like to see Brian Thrift's conversation. 
<laughs> I, this is bad, but I would like to see this conversation with Scott Martin. Okay. Just because they're very different people. Uh -huh. um, and we're only, I'm only sticking to fishing people because like that's okay. just my brain right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brian Thrift, Scott Martin. And oh. Not trying to give you an answer, but I feel like if you added G Man in there, it would make the conversation very interesting. <laughs> I, I was thinking I was thinking G Man. I was also thinking someone that could like instigate the two. Yeah, that's what I was saying, G Man. Because you feel like he would be an instigator. He could be like an instigator. That's a good one. I would, I would go. I would go those three. Yeah, I could see him or like uh, Paul Rosnick. I could see him being yeah. an instigator. For, I could just see that in his personality. At least from what I've seen. I don't say I don't know these guys, but yeah, I think that'd be awesome. It'd be cool to like hear the things they talk about and like talk about you know old school baits, like when they remember those baits coming out and. Um, one of the coolest videos that I found recently was uh, Brian Thrift and a couple other dudes sitting on the table just talking about like when the Whopper Plopper first came out. And oh. I thought that video was sweet. So, <laughs> what channel is that on? I think it was on Joe Holland Fishing. Joe Holland <laughs> Fish that followed me last year. I will. I definitely want to see that for sure. It was an inter interesting video. But yeah, those would be my three. Speaking of like Scott Martin and kind of like getting the SMC and whatever, yeah. um, dude, I would love to sit down with Brian Latimer and like talk about his first win because like you, I, if you want to talk about raw emotion, holy crap! Yeah, that's somebody who's like like living their dream, like they finally like accomplished what they wanted to do, and that's like I have never seen anybody react that way, and it was like I've never seen a more awesome win in a sense. Like, sure, it's cool to see championships, but, like, seeing yeah. someone react that way, that's how you know somebody truly has passion, like. Not only passion, but, like, has dedicated so much of themselves to making it happen, right? Like, so yeah. I was actually filming that. I was standing right next to Brandon, uh, Scott's cameraman, when he won. And, dude, it was, like, like brought tears to your eyes because you saw him. Yeah. Man, like, yeah. Oh, it was crazy. I feel like the world of fishing was all like patting him on the back in a sense. It was it was pretty yeah. like you know good job, dude. And it's like as I watch his videos on his YouTube, the way that dude can can use a rod, holy crap! Yeah, I can't do half of that stuff. Like just like a flick of a wrist and he's skipping baits like thirty feet away, and I'm like, yeah, I gotta line up my cast and everything. It's like, <laughs> all that, like I can't do that. Like flick of a wrist, left hand and right hand. Nah, the dude's a wizard. Uh, yeah. he's, Agreed. I would uh, kind of going along with that. I would love to like be in a boat with Brian Thrift, and like yeah. watch, like just be in a boat with him and Andy Montgomery and watch them skip. So Andy Montgomery and Brian Thrift are like two of the best skippers in the world. But they used to be team partners in North really? Carolina. Yeah, well, talk about hammers. Yeah. So you talk about like <laughs> I would leave the boat ramp if I saw them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd, I'd pull up and I'd like, okay, well, here's my money, dude. Fishing today. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But they were like team partners in North Carolina and they learned to skip on Lake Norman, which is like the okay. premier dock fishery in the yeah. country, or it used to be. But yeah. yeah, I think that'd be cool. I said, Andy Montgomery, I don't think I've seen a tournament where he wasn't trying to skip or flip and stuff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there could be like two docks on the lake. He'd have them marked. And just go <laughs> and back that's and it. That's it. He's just flipping back and forth. Yeah. All right. Capping off with his last question, which is another cool one. Um, most memorable fishing story? Um, so I have a lot of really cool stories that like I've recorded and videoed. Before I started YouTube, I remember I can remember the last time my grandpa and I fished together. So my grandpa was the one that like got me into the sport, like as far as I can yep. recall, and. He had he ended up developing Alzheimer's and dementia, and he got really sick. But like, I had just gotten back from Lake Champlain. Um, I had fished an Everstart out there, and Everstart used to be close to us, like yeah. eight years ago. Yeah, and uh, I had just learned about drop shotting, and we had gone out and just I got to help him fish, which like 
it was just really cool. Kind of like full circle. Yeah, like teacher, you know, student, student, yeah, teach the teacher, yeah, yeah. Teacher, dog, like I, I'd help him, and like it was very cool. Yeah, that's 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 pretty awesome, dude. Yeah. Pretty- so that that's most memorable, probably. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. I mean, I mean beyond that, I mean, that's, I think that's an awesome uh, part to end it on, really. Yeah. I mean, do you have any more things you want to, or any topics you want to bring up at all? No, dude. I just really appreciate you having me on here. And uh, I like watching the podcast progress. Like every day I log into YouTube and I'm like, oh, shoot, there's another podcast. Or like, yeah. I mean, dude, you're killing it. So just keep it up. Yeah, that's like one thing I'm trying to figure out though is if I want to like I'm not getting kind of real excited for things is should I schedule out like podcast dates or should I just like once they're done fire them out like I'm trying to been trying to figure that whole scenery out but right I mean, now I'm under, any tips, like like right now I'm kind of under this idea of building up content is better than you know, one problem I've always had with my YouTube channel is I'll have like seven videos and I'm like okay I'm gonna do daily and I'm just gonna post seven videos. The problem is, like, then I have one week of videos when I could really have three weeks of content. You yeah. know what I mean? So, like, scheduling it out yeah. might make it easier, and it'll make it easier for your audience to, like, know when to be watching. Mm-hmm. On the flip side, like, having, especially if you're going to put these up on, like, Spotify or, like, use Anchor to get them up on, like, all these other social apps, mm-hmm. um, it does build a good base. And then you can start scheduling them out, right? So, like in the next sure. yeah. podcast, be like, okay, guys, now we're gonna go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or we're gonna go Tuesday, Thursday, or we're gonna go once a week, you know? So yeah. then, so you have these first eight or nine or ten or however many you want to set as a base, and then you go with the schedule. And now every time it's Friday night, you drop a podcast on those people; mm. they like are ready to listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that for sure. Yeah. Yes. I think I definitely want to, uh, I'd like to build the following for it first yeah. before I really start, you know, dwelling into scheduling and making things very <laughs> formal. I think I got to get the, the following there for sure. Um, but I think in due time, I think I'll start making things, because right now my life is hectic being here in Indiana, so it's kind of hard <laughs> to think out and like... My, my biggest fear is making that schedule and saying, I'm going to do this and then not being able to live up to it. And that's what I don't want to do. I, I like to, I like to try to pride myself on being honest with what I'm, you know, pumping 